Hey, you nine. Thanks very much for coming, guys. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to be doing the exam review of your end of year exam that you guys have sat for year nine. And I'm going to be going through the questions uh, and talking through some of those more difficult questions. And I you guys are going to be making sure that you're making all the corrections on your exam paper in green pen. At the end of uh, the webinar, which should take less than an hour, you guys are going to just drop onto that sheet that I've sent you in the email. And that sheet, you're just going to put a yes into having watched the complete webinar. Yes in the column that is having made the corrections on your paper. And then fill in in the last column just some topics that you feel like you want to be doing some revision for. And then your teacher will be able to support you in that revision by providing you with exam style questions or any further discussions that you guys need. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly share my screen with you guys. I'm gonna click share. And then drop you guys into your exam paper. So, there we go. So your exam paper, there we go. So this is what you guys sat, it was 50 marks, it was done within uh, 50 minutes. Oh, sorry, it was 50 marks and it was done in one hour, so 60 minutes. I'm gonna be talking through the questions and just making sure that you guys understand what each one's doing and also highlighting any additional bits that you need for the GCSE and to kind of promote your understanding of the questions and hopefully be able to allow you to make progress in your next test. Okay, so uh, question number one. Substances, substances can be classified as elements, compounds, or mixtures. It is then given you a sequence of boxes, six boxes, that you then have to analyze uh, in terms of their content. So it's really nice to kind of, rather than answering the questions, because the next two questions then say, explain which two boxes represent elements. And the second one being, explain which two boxes contain mixtures. Well, I actually think it's far more beneficial to explain which ones, and we can just go all the way through all six. So the first box, which is uh, helium. So this one is an element. And of course, the reason being is because it contains one single type of atom. One, and I'm going to shrink my pen size here because it's really ridiculously too large. Uh, my... my tablet is not behaving quite as well as it has been over the last few days so this one here is an element and that's because it contains one and i can't just put one atom i have to say one type and that's the key thing isn't it they're looking for your de definitions one type of atom and in this case it contains three helium atoms or which is a noble gas found in group eight of the periodic table the next one is also an element so this one, of course, is not helium. This one is hydrogen. And once again, looking at the diagram, it's because it contains one type of atom. And it's nice to see that they are all H's. The fact that they are bound into pairs makes absolutely no difference in this particular case. They are all the same type of atom, H, 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 and H, which means this is still an element. Next. Okay, now this one's far more interesting. This one, of course, is a mixture. And this one is a mixture. Now, we get to go in a little bit further now. Uh, will this all be in my exam? Uh, ben, have you not sat the year nine test yet? If you haven't, I'd probably say not what, please don't watch the webinar. We can always provide you with a separate paper if need be, um, but it's probably easier if you don't. So, okay, this one's a mixture. But now we get to go a little bit further because we can state what the mixture is made from. And the mixture here is made from two elements. And why are they two elements? It's the reason is because we've got the element helium and then the element of hydrogen. So it's a mixture of two elements in this particular case, but definitely a mixture. And of course, the, uh, the question in the actual paper will, will, will pick that apart momentarily. The next one, this is a compound. It's a pure compound, and we have got three molecules that hopefully all of you will recognize. This is H2O, but it's not an element. This is a pure compound, a substance made from two different types of atoms, chemically bonded. So we've got H, H bonded, chemically bonded, and I'll just highlight the bonding, chemically bonded to oxygen. 
So this is a compound and there's only one of them in there. So it's not a mixture. It is pure and it is a compound. Next one. Here's our second mixture. And in this case, it's a bit more complicated because we have rather than a mixture of two elements, here we have a mixture of an element, which is hydrogen gas and water. So we've got a mixture here of an one element and one compound. I'm just going to put comp one compound. Next. Oh, this is once again, it's pure, but it's also more importantly, a compound. And in this case, it's a very unusual substance, but it appears a lot of GCSE. This is hydrogen peroxide. So this is H2O2. But notice that all the molecules are the same. So it is, it is a compound. It is not a mixture because it's only one substance. It's pure. And then we can drop into our questions. And it simply states, explain which two boxes represent an element. So the first mark on your exam paper was for selecting the two correct boxes. Now, this question is quite difficult. The reason being is if you get that wrong, the chances of you getting the explanation is going to be borderline zero. So if you score, if you either, you either tend to score two or zero. Um, so definitely corrections need to be made. And the reason why boxes one and two are elements is because they both, box one contains only helium atoms, so one type of atom, and box number two contains only hydrogen atoms. Now you'll notice I have put these boxes contain only one type of atom. You could have also subdivided this and said box one. I'll try and make this a little bit bolder so you guys can see it a little bit more clearly. Box one contains only, contains only helium atoms. That's totally fine as well, That'll, that's accepted. And then you can follow it up with box two contains only hydrogen atoms. So but those two are the reasons for them being elements. Which two are mixtures? So we had one mixture being box three. I'm going to try and do that again. One mixture being box three and one mixture being box five. And the key to this, the second mark here, which a lot of students didn't get, was, but, was your first mark is for saying the two boxes. There's your first one, tick. And the second one is for stating, you've got a couple of choices here. Number one, box, box three contains helium atoms and hydrogen molecules. Notice my change in wording. Guys, year nine, I like to use these opportunities of these, these, these exam paper reviews as not only just me giving you the right answers and showing you a mark scheme, but it gives me an opportunity to be able to give you a little bit of tuition in terms of how we can make this better. Notice my change in wording in this particular question. Box three contains helium atoms. Let's highlight the helium atom. It's actually a helium atom, singular. And then, and also hydrogen molecules. Now that word is usually, is, is, is commonly used um, poorly by students. That they, they don't quite understand what a molecule is. A molecule is anything with more than, uh, with two or more atoms bonded together. So in this case, this is a molecule of hydrogen. So you get the mark for simply stating what the box contains that it has now you could have alternatively stated the definition of a com of a mixture the defini definition of a mixture a container holding more two or more two or more different atoms slash molecules that are not chemically bonded. So just consider what these words are saying, chemically bonded. So just to quickly kind of draw what, what, now I'm a big believer in words don't mean an awful lot without a diagram. I'm not a wordy person. I, uh, and, and diagrams really help me. A container which contains two or more different atoms or molecules. I'd like to think that you guys can realize that these are atoms. That's an atom. That's an atom. But then this one's a molecule. But notice two or more different atoms or molecules 
that are not chemically bonded. So we notice that this one is not chemically bonded to Y, and these are not chemically bonded to X, so this must be a mixture. Next, box number five contains hydrogen molecules and water molecules. Nice to actually see that. So we've got two hydrogen molecules. They're molecules because they have two atoms bonded together, but they're an element because the same atoms are bonded. And we've got also got a compound molecule there as well. But these are not chemically bonded. So that is a mixture. Okay, so a relatively straightforward start, but there were problems along the way. The idea of not being able to, if you score, uh, if you get, if you get uh, the first one, then you can, you, can, you, you can potentially lose the second one, but if you don't get the first one, you definitely won't get the second. Okay, next one is a, a, just a short question on the different types of separation techniques. So we have, we need to separate water from a sodium chloride solution. Right, so I have been given a beaker, I have been given a beaker containing salt water. And in this, by the way, in this particular case, it's a very particular one, otherwise commonly known as brine, which is sodium chloride water. And what they want me to do is they want me to collect the water. I can't use evaporation because if I use evaporation, I'm going to lose the water. I need to pass this through a condenser and keep it. This is distillation. By the way, common referred to as simple distillation. So distillation was the first mark. It definitely couldn't have been chromatography. Chromatography is separating inks and soluble substances. Crystallization is used to produce salt crystals. Distillation is used to separate liquids from mixtures. And filtration is used to separate insoluble solutes, uh, insoluble substances from solutions, such as sand from water. Okay, next. Separating the, the blue dye from a mixture of blue and red dyes. So we learn that chromatography is the one here that's used for separating inks. And of course, we know this picture, it comes up later in the paper. We put our spot and we're going to get our red smudge and we're going to get our blue smudge. So that's chromatography. And the last one is we want to separate potassium nitrate from potassium nitrate solution. So this time I've switched. I don't want now to be collecting the water. I now want the solid. So I'm going to use crystallization. Now, crystallization is edXL's very particular uh, twist on that particular question, because a lot of the time students will often write evaporation. Evaporation. Uh, now, edXL for IGCSE want you to know that evaporation as a procedure is called crystallization. So nice to see that. And it's nice also that they didn't include it in the name set. So you guys, some of you guys were looking for evaporation, and I think most of you realized that the, the version of evaporation is crystallization. So, a nice question. Okay, next. Right, so this time we were given a method for solubility. Add an excess of solid water in a boiling tube and stir. Measure the temperature of saturated solution. Weigh and empty into an evaporating basin. Pour some of the saturated solution into the evaporating basin. Weigh the basin and content. Heat the evaporating basin to remove all the water. Weigh the basin and the remaining solid. So it said, calculate the mass of solid obtained and the mass of water removed. Right. So the first thing we wanted to pick up here is that this is the mass of the basin. The yellow is, let's just draw this out. This here is the mass of the basin plus the solution. The next one, this one is just simply an empty basin. And the last one, and the last one is a basin with just the crystals in, that the solid remaining. So what you realize is that none of them actually give you any of the direct masses. You've got to do a little bit of clever, oh, um, Bo Yang, I am, uh, I, I'm late. Don't worry about it. Will this all be, okay. Is crystallization acceptable for question 1B3? 1B3. Yes, crystallization is the correct answer. That's the correct answer to Ben. Uh, if it's been marked incorrectly, Ben, you can gain one. Bring it in and show me. I'll have a look. Instead of instead of S, instead of S, not Z. 
Oh, are you saying would they care if it was spelled with the letter Z? Oh, they, they won't particularly care. You're choosing from a list. So it's nice to realize that the S there is actually already given to you. Isn't it funny? Because I've just spelled it incorrectly because I put a single L in. Ha! Hilarious. Um, if you put a Z, I don't think they'll really care. They probably wouldn't even notice. Okay. So we need to work out the mass of the solid left behind. Well, if we want the solid left behind, we need to take this value here and minus the basin. So I did that. 94.9 minus the basin mass gives us 5.3 grams. This was answered really well by the entire year group. Majority of students were on it. Really, really pleased. Next one, I want the basin. I want uh, the mass of the water removed. Now, this is a bit more tricky because what you need to realize is that we have, um, we have an empty basin, but then we have a basin plus water and a basin plus the solid. So which ones do you do? Well, what you want to do is you realize that this, this particular part here contains the solid, s liquid, and the basin. Well, this one, this, one, this one here is just the basin. This one is basin plus salt plus water. This is basin plus salt. So if I want the water, I'm going to take that mass and minus that mass. So I do 115 minus 94. Just going to clean this up a bit. 115.8 uh, minus 94.9, and I will get the water which I lost, which was 20.9. Cool. Uh, next. Okay. One of the more, tr this is actually one of the harder questions on the paper, and it really needs a little bit of explanation. In another experiment, a different, at a different temperature, the mass of solid obtained is 10.5 grams. And the mass of water removed is 16.8. Right, what have they just told me? They have just told me that when they, they, they discounted the basin, they said that the mass of the solid produced, the mass of the solid crystals produced, which is there, was 10.5 grams of salt, right? It then told you that the water removed, the water that had evaporated away was 16.8 grams, right, of H2O. Right, now we know, everybody in this webinar knows that solubility, solubility is grams of solute dissolved per 100 grams of water. The grams of solid, the grams of solute that can dissolve to form a saturated solution in 100 grams of water at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, this is actually the bit I want to focus on here, folks, which is the units. Now, you should have seen this in biology and physics by now, which is we often write this as grams per 100 grams of water. And this per is written as a slash. That means per. Well, that doesn't mean per, folks. That means divided by. Now, what we can do, the problem is here, is that we haven't got 100 grams of water, and so therefore we, we're going to struggle to find the mass in 100 grams. But what we can find out is that I have, I have 16.8 grams of water. And in that, floating around, dissolved, is 10.5 grams of salt. So here's a question for you. How much, what mass, what mass in one gram of water? So what you can say is if 10 grams, 10.5 grams, dissolved in 16.8 grams, 
10.5 per 16.8 grams of water. If I run that equation, 10.5 divided by 16.8, it will tell me that 0 0.625 grams of salt dissolved, dissolved in one gram of water. And now I can get it to 100. And I know, guys, that's really tough. And I know that's difficult. So when you times it up by 100, times by 100, and I have 62.5 grams of salt per 100 grams of water. I know that's tricky, folks. It was, a really, it was one of the hardest questions on the paper. It required you guys to have an understanding of the numbers. The, the year nine end of year exam review is on view only. Oh, okay. Helping, I'll fix that before the end of the webinar. Let's see if I can fix it now, in fact. Uh, advanced. Uh, anyone can view, figured it out, fixed. No, I haven't, I am. Anyone can, view, anyone can edit. There we go. There we go, Helping, all done for you. Send, fixed. Right, go back to the webinar. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, next. If the, right, this is again quite tricky and requires a little bit of thought. If the evaporating basin is heated too strongly, some of the solid decomposes to form a gas. What effect would this have on the calculation of solubility? Right, let's just draw this out. I've got, I need to try and find a space here. I've already scribbled all over this, right. I've got an evaporating basin with a solution in. Let's just, just for fun, let's put in 100 grams of water. Let's say I now have a solid dissolved in it. I'm going to evaporate and I get crystals left behind. And I have at the end of it 10 grams of crystals. What's my solubility? 10 grams per... 100 grams of water, not complicated. But if I continue to heat it, some of the crystals decompose and form a gas, which means I'm going to lose it, which means I won't have 10 grams at the end. I'm going to have less. So I'm going to see eight grams. And therefore, my calculation would be 8 grams per 100 grams of water. So this question was quite clever because it required you to have a bit of thought and lots of people in exams rush. So let's have a look at my answer. So it says, first mark, the gas, so it says solid decomposes to form a gas. A gas, uh, sorry, the gas formed escapes to the atmosphere. So the gas that I have made is going to leave. That's one mark. The gas I make is going to escape. Next, what impact is this going to have? The mass of the solid, therefore, is going to be less. Instead of me getting 10 grams of crystals at the end, I'm going to get eight or nine. I'm going to get less of it. So this will appear. Solubility will appear lower. It's not easy, folks. That's a tricky question, requires a bit of thought. Next, right, we go back to our nice straightforward ones. So this was our, and guy, I mean, year nine, you have been told that you're going to see these questions in your GCSE. Make sure you practice. So the first question says, use the information in the table and the following questions. You may use once, less, as more than once, twice, not at all, multiple times, whatever. Choose a substance that is a solid at 3,000 Celsius. Right, now you can actually see, I've shown how I've done this, but I'm actually going to redo it just for clarity purposes. So I always teach, in lesson, I teach the thermometer line. And on the thermometer line, there are two lines. One is the melting point, MPT, and one is the boiling point. Now in between, below the melting point will be the state symbol solid. In between melting point and boiling point is going to be a liquid and above it will be a gas. So now we all we have to do is apply this concept to the, to, the, to the data. 
So let's have a look at substance P. Let's draw my line, right? There's my line. Here's the melting point and here's the boiling point. Okay, so all I now have to do is find out where 3,000 3, fits in there. Where does 3,000 fit? Well, 3,000, you can, you can see that it's increasing number. 3,000 fits here, which means it's going to be a solid, which was the very first question. A solid at 3,000 Celsius, so it's going to be P. Let's just, for fun and games, let's run everybody else. Right, where does 3,000 fit on here? Way over here somewhere. So that would be a gas at 3,000. What about the next one? Next one's even more ridiculous. 3,000 is over here somewhere. So that's going to be a gas. The melted boiling point's there. This is a gas. 3,000's way over here somewhere. Let's look at the next one. Oh, this one's a bit more interesting. Where's 3,000? Right in the middle. So there's 3,005. There's 4,000. So we're now going to have somewhere in the middle. 3,000 is going to be about, I think it's a bit more over the other side. There's 3,000. So it's going to be a liquid. That one would be a liquid at 3,000. Let's do the next one. Right, a liquid at 25. Let's go back to my lines and change my color. Where would 25 fit in for P? Way down here. P is going to be a solid at 25. Next one, 7, 3, 4, 1, 25 is down here somewhere. It's a solid. Where's 25? Ah, minus 95 and 69. It's going to flag up. 25 is going to be around about there. I don't like how fat that is. Let's try that again. Oh, it's ridiculous. There we go. 25 fits in here, so it is going to be a liquid. 25 here is back down at this point, so that one's also going to be a solid. So my answer was R. Nice and easy. Next, question number four. Okay, next one. So... It gave you a rather mean question because you guys are, are probably, I'd probably say are not quite at the level because you may not have seen this symbol yet. That symbol, which is drawn like this, that symbol means a reaction, a chemical reaction is reversible. It's reversible. That means it can go backwards. So they started life this whole practical started with ammonium chloride solid at the bottom that's there and they're going to heat it when they heat it it breaks apart and becomes a gas ah state symbols we've just gone from gas from solid straight to gas it ticks this box down here what state change is occurring subliming this is sublimation Next, what am I going to make? Well, it tells you. So the solid X, you were meant, those students here, you should have, what you should have done is actually just taken it right out of the equation and just written down that there, drops onto that line there, ammonium chloride. You're totally, of course, allowed to convert that into a proper name. Ammonium, important, chloride. And the next thing is to realize what gases are made. So you were allowed, funnily enough, you were allowed just simply to put in the, the, the formula out of the equation. So you, that actually gets you both marks, which I think is rather lovely. And of course, most people, though, decided to name them, and most people knew them. This is ammonia. A couple of people put ammonium, and it's not now. Ammonium is MH4. And this one, HCl, everyone... A common mistake, everyone calls hydrochloric acid, and it is if it's in water. So just for those students who don't know, HCl as a gas is hydrogen chloride. You can't be an acid outside of water. And water, of course, means you're dissolved. This is aqueous. That is hydrochloric acid be aware you cannot have be an acid outside of water just a nice thing to add to your notes so it had to be if you named it it had to be hydrogen chloride and not and not hydrochloric acid lots of students lost that one next okay 
Everyone has seen this in school. Every year nine class has seen this demonstration and should recognize it and know that these questions are regular appearances on GCSE. So it gave us our diagram of a glass tube and we have a cotton wool soaked in ammonia solution and a cotton wool soaked in hydrochloric acid. And this is all about diffusion. I've got a, on my webinar, by the way, I think on my, uh, on my YouTube channel, there was a video of me performing this practical if anybody wants to watch it back. So it asked you where the white solid was going to appear and the white solid is going to appear here. So we're gonna form a ring of white smoke. Now they asked you, so they, they had to choose it was C. So one mark for C. Next one is for stating these two. Ammonia has an MR of 17, and, hyd and you can see how I've then broken it up to make this easy to, to see this. Has an MR of 17, and hydrochloric acid has an MR of 36.5. Now, in reality, you didn't actually have to say any of this. This is not required for the mark. You could have simply stated HCl is heavier than ammonia. Totally allowed. Don't use density. They wanted mass here. Uh, you could have also said ammonia is lighter. You could have said either one to gain that mark. Next. Therefore, now guys, you're going to hate me for this. Therefore, in this case, ammonia, I have said, because it's the lighter of them, therefore diffuses faster. This is not a mark. This is a nightmare. Because the problem is, it needed to say, at the end of the experiment, explain which position diffuses faster is, is, is vague because diffusion happens from an area of high concentration to low concentrations and the particles move relatively in one direction but they're moving randomly. What they wanted here was the idea of the moving at distance because they need to explain the position. You need to say that because the molecules are moving faster, they're going to travel a greater distance than the hydrochloric acid. So the third mark is for stating that the ammonia travels further in the time given because it's lighter. So tricky question that. Notice that I've just done a three mark question and given six bullet points because in my mind, those bullet points make me understand it. That's why I've done it. Okay, question number five, nice and easy. A student, which of these, sorry, I'll just skip to the question. Which of these methods is used to separate the green coloring from the remaining grass. Let's draw it out. So I've got a beaker and I've added, so the student wants to find the green coloring in glass. They use a solvent, so they add a liquid and they add some grass. Okay, let's add some, add some grass to this. Uh, look at that. <laughs> That's kind of cool, isn't it? Added a couple of leaves of grass there. I'm now gonna grind this up using a mortar and pestle. I may be doing this really badly with a stirring rod. Okay, and I'm gonna do that. How do I now, how do I separate the green coloring? Because that's going to become, what's this picture gonna become? It's going to become a pale, a pale green solution filled with little bits of leftover leaf or grass. How do I get rid of the grass? I filter it. The grass is a solid that is insoluble. I'm just going to filter it out. Let's draw the diagram. Filter funnel, conical flask. Shouldn't do the curved bottom. It's not good. It should be a 2D diagram. Filter paper. We're going to pour it in on top. The liquid is going to pass through the bottom because it'll pass through the filter paper. And I'm going to be left with my, the liquid vanishes and my green grass pieces would be left on the filter paper. Okay, next. Okay, most people did well on this question. It was answered pretty, it was answered reasonably across the year group. Label the diagram for chromatography. The solvent is the liquid in the bottom. The original spot, this is the only one where students have made errors. Lots of people have pointed to the original spot being this one. That is not correct. The original spot will have been on the baseline. And the paper is just the paper. It's relatively easy. Then it says, how many different dyes are present in the green food coloring? One mark. 
you state A and number four. One, two, three, three, four. Four, four different inks, four different colorings, dyes. And it then says, explain. The problem is, guys, lots of people put four. Move on. You've lost it because you need to explain it. And so the explanation is, since there are four spots produced during chromatography. Four spots have been produced. So we're going to get four different colors, four different dyes. Next, nice, easy labeling. I'm not going to actually name and shame the person who wrote the, 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 the funniest answer. And in fact, I love him for this. Funniest answer for the entire year, folks. Name X. It's a stirring rod. Nothing funny about this. Uh, I had a couple of people write stick. I really like that. If you're going to be in chemistry, I can't imagine going to the garden and just staring, stirring my beaker with a stick. I just thought that was hilarious. Um, lots of people put thermometer. That's not correct. A thermometer diagram always is drawn with a bulb like that. Uh, but the funniest answer for the year group, and I'd give him three commendations for this, is the name of why and the best answer all year is heating tube. I always liked that. I thought that was brilliant. Uh, so Bunsen burner is the correct name for why, like that. Next. Sorry, my laptop is hiccuping ever so slightly. There we go. A liquid that dissolves in a substance, a liquid that dissolves substances, sorry, is a solvent. The solvent is the liquid, the solute is the solid, the solution is the combination of the two, and a suspension is a solid appearing in a, is a solid floating around in a liquid. The clear liquid formed in stage one is called a solution. Relatively easy. Solution, when you mix, when you mix the solid together, you're going to form a solution. So the solute and solvent, you'll make a, make a solution. In stage one, two, and three, where is the sand collected? It is, of course, stage two. Sand is insoluble, so we're going to be leaving our sand behind in the filter paper, and the solution will pass through. Next, where will we collect the salt? And that will be in stage three. We're going to evaporate. We're going to evaporate the water and leave behind the solid crystals at the end when all the water is gone. Relatively straightforward. Next. What happens to the water in stage three? Number one, I like to do this properly, it boils and therefore turns into a gas and escapes into the air. I know that students will want to write one thing for that, for one mark, but you shouldn't because I don't know what the mark was for. So you always do it properly and the mark in fact was the fact that it's going to escape into the air. Next, bromine is an element in group seven, which the following is the molecule, the formula for molecule of bromine. Right, so bromine travels around in pairs. So you guys know that when you have H2O, the two is down at the bottom, not, not superscripted, subscript. The big two in front means you have two of them. So in fact, let's explain each one. What does this mean? This means I have BR and BR, but they are separate. The two means I simply have two of them. This doesn't mean anything at all. This means that there's going to be usually the higher number. Can you tick instead of cross the box? Yes, I'll allow it. Did you, did you gain one now, Ben? You shouldn't do it. Cross it, please, in future. That's not right because numbers should never go in the air. The only thing that goes in the air like that is charge. You'll come to that next year. A big two after. Nope, doesn't float either. It's the little two at the bottom telling us it's going around in a pair. Hard question. Required you to have done a little bit of extra reading, which was kind of its purpose. Next, which of the processes causes the brown gas to fill the jar? So we know that bromine starts life as a liquid. It evaporates into a gas and then will spread out. And it says, which of these processes fills the jar? And filling the jar is diffusion. 
it's going to spread out and fill the jar. It's not condensation, that's, li that's gas to liquid. It's not evaporation. Evaporation is liquid to gas. That's what's happening here, but it's not filling the jar, and it's certainly not sublimation. Explain in terms of particle theory the observations seen in the gas jar. Right, guys, this one you'll notice I've put in something that all of you have said, but I've highlighted it in red. So the first mark, first mark here is for saying that bromine evaporates. One mark. It can't fill the gas jar unless it's a gas. So it needs to evaporate. Second one, everyone now put bromine then diffuses or goes through diffusion. This is not a mark. Read the question. Explain using particle theory. Saying the word diffusion tells me nothing about the particles. The particles will move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That's what they wanted. There were a few alternatives. You're allowed to say that the molecules move around randomly and spread out. That was allowed. Any description of the motion of the particles. Next. It was horrible. Bit of chromatography. Explain why it is important for the solvent level to below be below the spots. This is to prevent the spots from dissolving into the solvent. Because if it devolve, dissolves into the solvent, it definitely won't run up the paper. It'll just drop straight into the water. But you are meant to say to prevent dissolving in the solvent. So that one, I think most of us teachers have been very generous on that marking. Some of you might not have actually got that in a real exam, but lots of people have said it drops into, to prevent it dropping the dyes from dropping into the water or into the solvent, and we've kind of given it. So an improvement definitely to be made, but reasonable answers, good chemistry. Okay, next, to work out the RF value, I don't know how you guys have misread this question. One of the pigment in vegetable oil extracts is not shown in the diagram. It appears at a very faint spot at 1.3 centimeters cubed. It's told you the distance it's traveled. Calculate the RF value. You measure six on the bottom, divide the two numbers, and you get zero point. Everyone knows that all RF values start with a zero. So when students, I've got one student writing 58. He's definitely not going to be right there. Suggest a reason why there is a spot on the starting line for chromatography of sweet potato. Right, so let's have a quick look at the sweet potato, which is number three. So if we look at sweet potato, it's got a spot left behind. That's because it is clearly not soluble. So we have a substance that is, there is, there was an insoluble compound in the sweet potato. Mark there is for insoluble, so it doesn't move. If they asked you to explain it, you just say non-soluble, so it won't move. Next, which is the formula for a molecule of an element Right, molecule, you need two or more atoms bonded together. So it can't be A. It could be B. Can't be, can't be C because that's a compound. An element must have the same type of atom, and that doesn't either. So the answer, of course, is B. It's an only hydrogen atoms, and they're bound together in a molecule. Which one's a mixture? Sodium is an element. Chlorine is an element. Sodium chloride is a compound, but a solution is a mixture. A mixture of a solvent and a solute. Clever that. Next. We're nearly at the end of the paper now, folks. This is great. The apparatus used is to separate a mixture of liquids with similar boiling points. Fill in the words. Right. So, in reality, I like to expand on this. This here, this piece of equipment, is a round bottom flask. Round bottom because it's round. <laughs> that there is a round bottom flask. Very, very British. Very posh name. This is called a fractionating column. This is called a condenser. And this one is called a conical flask. So which ones do they want? The mixture of liquids is placed in the right. It should be round bottom, but there's only one that fits this flask. Then, then the, during the heating, the parts of the mixture boil and pass up the column. 
the fractionating column and the water is the, the water is used to cool the vapor in the condenser or denser and i think one more question and we're done year nine right i think there's a lot of year nine students out there kicking themselves over this question complete the diagram showing four particles how many people drew loads of them lose it the whole point is to read the question and that needs must need to be four so there's the right answer all spread out it's an easy fix explain why heating a liquid causes it to evaporate more quickly first mark particles gain kinetic energy when you heat it more particles will now have the energy to break the bonds i just thought i'd quickly show you that folks since i'm sharing my screen i don't know how well this is going to work on the internet but if you warm something up i don't know how well this is going to manage it you can see the bonds between the particles and you can see that i've warmed it up and the red one has just left it's just left the it's just broken a bond but it's not quite it's not it's, it's evaporating but very slowly if i raise it i'm giving them more kinetic energy and more of the particles have the energy to break the bonds. Let's restart that. I want to get it at just the right temperature. Right. The blue, the, these blues over here are evaporating. You can't see me circle that, can you? But these, you can see the liquid is still just about holding together. But the higher the temp, look, you can see the particles escaping. Some of the particles can escape and break those bonds. But the higher the temperature, means that more particles, more particles have the energy to break the bonds. Right, guys, that brings us to the end of our webinar. If you can all now, those people have managed to make it to the end, thank you so much. Let's see if we can get me back and unshare my screen. Uh, um, um, stop sharing screen, should bring me back. We were back. Year nines, thank you so much for getting to the end of it. It's taken us 50 minutes to get all the way through. Thank you very much. I really hope it was useful. If you have any further questions, always come and ask me. You know, I am always available to help. Always. Uh, if you can go straight onto that sheet and just put a yes, yes, and a couple of things that you want to work on, that would be great. You nine, have a lovely rest of your evening. It's been great to see you. Take care. Bye now.